thank you for joining us for this event with Philip Mansell. And just before I introduce Philip, our speaker this evening, I'd like to thank you for your greatly valued support towards the library. We are, as you'll probably know, celebrating its 180th year and its distinctive and incredible contribution to literature, writers, readers and thinkers. And since 1841, as you know as well, the library has been self-financing and independently funded. So philanthropy really is at its centre. And this continues through your support, whether it's by leaving a legacy, by adopting books and caring for the collections, supporting the library's outreach programmes so we can reach more people, and giving most recently to the COVID response library fund appeal, and particularly as a, a library founders circle patron, you continue this tradition and that helps to sustain the library so that it can continue to flourish and grow. And now I'm thrilled to be welcoming Philip Mansell who's going to talk to us this evening. Philip is a celebrated historian of courts and cities and the author of 14 books of history and biography about France and the Ottoman Empire. Tonight, he's going to be talking to us about his latest biography, King of the World, The Life of Louis XIV, which was a Telegraph, Spectator and BBC History magazine book of the year. We're very proud to say that Philip has been a, a member since 1978 and he won the London Library's Life in Literature Award in 2012. If after this event you want to do some extra reading on the subject, Philip wrote a fantastic piece in issue 46 of the London Library's magazine about women writers of the French court. And there, in there as well, there's much on Louis XIV. So now I will hand over to Philip, who will talk to us about one of the most interesting and influential monarchs in European history. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much, Melanie. And I just want to say, and it comes from the heart and the head, that I, I couldn't have written this book without the London Library. It really is fantastic, particularly for French court memoirs and diaries, which, which really are the, the stuff of life for me and reading, being able to take the diaries of the Marquis de Soche home with me from the London Library really was fabulous. And I'm talking today about Louis XIV, as a global monarch, as a European monarch, because I don't really believe in national history. I think it's, it distorts perspectives. It's completely artificial. And in Louis XIV's day, I want to quote something one of his secretaries, Monsieur de Callier, wrote about Europe. All the states of which Europe is composed have between them necessary liaisons and connections, which mean that one can regard them as members of one same republic, republic meaning a political unit, and it is almost impossible for a considerable change to take place in any of its members without it troubling the repose of all the others. And Louis XIV was both a French nationalist bent on expansion and a member of the European family of kings. And here is a picture of one of the key moments of his reign and indeed of the history of Europe. He is recognizing his grandson, Philippe Duc d'Anjou, as King of Spain in 1700. And I just want to read to you what he said, 16th of November, 1700, in the Grand Cabinet du Roi in Versailles, the power center of France. Monsieur, here is the King of Spain. His birth called him to this crown, the late King also by his will. The whole nation desired it and begged me for it pressingly. Please note, even Louis XIV is talking about popular will and the nation. It was the decree of heaven. I have accorded it with pleasure. Then turning to his grandson, he says, be a good Spaniard, it is now your first duty, but remember that you were born French in order to maintain the union between the two nations. It is the way to keep them happy and to maintain the peace of Europe. 
So in 1700, as in most other years in European history, the ideas of nations and Europe are there present in everybody's minds. And I think this is a key to Louis XIV. He's not just King of France, he's also a European monarch. Here you see a contemporary print of that event. And here is Philip V in Spanish dress as King of Spain. And here are the pillars of Hercules, the Straits of Gibraltar, which is really a symbol of the global reach of the Spanish monarchy, which then ruled most of South America, Central America, and colonies elsewhere in the world. It was a global prize, not always. There you see why can his grandson become king of Spain? Because Louis XIV here has married the Infanta of Spain, Maria Theresa. So he has the best claim to the throne. This is Louis XIV meeting Philip IV in 1660. And this is Velázquez, who is not only a court painter, but also a, the chief um, furniture official of the palace. He was, in fact, the wedding organizer for this spectacular wedding. And here is a map showing the war of the Spanish succession, 1701 to 1713. Really, France is fighting on all fronts. And even though France is frequently defeated in these battles here, Blenheim, Ramillies, and so on, yet it goes on fighting just to put the king's younger grandson on the throne of Spain. And it wins. Louis XIV does, in fact, win the war of the Spanish succession. And there is still a Bourbon and a descendant of Louis XIV reigning in Madrid today as Philip VI. And I said it wasn't always for the best of reasons. This is the commercial background to the obsession with making the grandson king of Spain. It is about import. Who would have the right to import slaves, enslaved people from Africa to Spanish America? And Louis XIV wanted that right for a French company. As the French ambassador in Madrid said, ce commerce est très avantageux. This trade is very profitable. That is the only thing that mattered to them. But in the end, England wins the contract by the peace of 1713. And both Queen Anne and Louis XIV personally invested in the slave trade. And here is a, the son of an African monarch, Isinia, near Benin on the Guinea coast. And he had come to France. It's possible he met Louis XIV. He became an officer in the French army. Then he returned to Africa. And then he's lost sight of by French officials. They said he rendered himself unworthy of the graces of the king. Here is the Louis XIV, who is familiar to us uh, at a carousel as emperor of the Romans, an ambitious young ruler determined to expand. In his mind, he's not only emperor of the Romans, but he's going to be a new Alexander the Great. Why Alexander? Because Alexander was both a hereditary monarch of King of Macedonia and a world conqueror. So already he's got a non-French model of behavior. And he's a military mon mon monarch. In my opinion, the key to Louis XIV is the army. And this is the inscription on his cannons in the courtyard of the Hotel des Invalides in Paris. Ultima ratio regum, or cannons were the last argument of kings. Louis XIV may have believed in divine right, in spreading the Catholic religion, but ultimately he was a soldier. And he, first, his ambitions were spread in the north and east of France. He surrounds France with 150 forts, shown here in red, and he wins three fine provinces, French Flanders, Alsace, 
and France Comté. Uh, um, and just to show you, he's not trapped in Versailles. He's not based only in Paris and Versailles. This, uh, these are the travels of his personal engineering uh, supremo, whom he often saw, Vauban, the famous Vauban, the best military architect of his day. He's really going all over France to try and design its fortifications. And the king himself goes all over France too. You see, these are the king's travels, particularly to the northeast. He visited Dunkirk six times, Calais five times. Very few French rulers would have done that and before the 20th century. Really everywhere except Brittany and Dauphiné. Here he is in Toulouse, being greeted on bended knee by the officials of Toulouse. Here is one of the many forts which he built to surround France. This is Neuf Breizac, just outside Alsace. And some of these forts went on serving to defend France up to 1940. Some of them were incorporated in the Maginot Line. And I'm just going to show you a few of the pictures showing him entering conquered towns of the Low Countries. This is Arras. This is Cotre, which he briefly won, but is still in Belgium. This is his, him and his army crossing the Rhine in 1672 when he's attacking the Netherlands. This is him in front of Maastricht as a Roman emperor crowned with victory. And at the battle of at the siege of Maastricht, he is assisted by English forces because he is then allied to Charles II. And one of the English officers was the young John Churchill, then known as the handsome Englishman. So Churchill learned part of his military art under the French Marshal Turenne and Louis XIV. This is Charles II painted in France as an exile. He was Louis XIV's first cousin, very much part of his life and reign. They knew each other well and they would bargain with each other over alliances and treaties and who would get what bit of the Netherlands. It's as here is Louis XIV entering Dunkirk, which he has bought from Charles II. Here is Charles II as Neptune, a painting by Verio in the Royal Collection. Here he is Neptune ruling the waves while Louis XIV plays Mars ruling the earth. They are allies against the Netherlands. England was just as often an ally of France as an enemy of it. And here is one of Louis XIV's most effective agents, Louise de Queroual, who is the French mistress of Charles II. And she corresponds with the French ambassador and with Louis XIV himself. And she keeps Louis Charles II pro-French. Her luxurious apartment in Whitehall was the true center of English government in those days. And she has an what is probably an enslaved African servant with her offering coral and pearls. And she's showing the tabouret or footstool, which only duchesses were allowed to sit on at the French court. She is both Duchess of Portsmouth in her own right in England and Duchess d'Aubigny in France, showing how important the role of a royal mistress was then considered. And here is one of the many triumphal arches, which you can still see in Paris, the Porte Saint-Martin, showing him winning Franche Comté in the 1670s, again dressed as a Roman emperor. They are smaller but considerably more elegant than the Arc de Triomphe of Napoleon. 
Here it is. You see Louis XIV as a Hercules. He was indeed a very fine dancer and rider and huntsman, extremely fit until old age. Here he is before Besançon, capital of Franche-Comte in 1674, entering a town of the Low Countries. He always takes the court with him. Please note his wife, the Queen, in a carriage. And he's quite a statesman in these conquered provinces. He doesn't impose Paris rules or Paris law or even the French language in Alsace. So he's in some ways a more effective conqueror than Napoleon later. Here he is outside Strasbourg. It's he who makes Strasbourg French without a shot being fired in anger. In fact, the town council was so frightened that it handed him the keys. You see them again on bended knee, handing Louis XIV the keys of the city. And unlike the rest of France, the people of Alsace were not obliged to conform to Catholicism. They could remain Lutheran or Calvinist. Here he is again outside Alsace, outside Mons in 1691 as a fighting monarch in one of the many wars of his reign. And the last time he went on campaign in the Low Countries, which he, he said he knew as well as the Ile de France in 1692. Thereafter, he did stay at Versailles. So he's interested in French expansion up to the Rhine. He, he leaves France larger than he founded, which Napoleon did not do. He's also interested in the rest of the world. Here he is founding the Academy of Sciences. Please note the globe on the bottom right. Colbert, his great trade and financial minister, is behind him in black. Here is Colbert again really the chief minister of the reign. As long as Colbert is there, finances are okay and major mistakes are avoided. After Colbert's death in 1683, really worn out by the, uh, the stress of helping supervise the construction of Versailles and basically running Louis XIV's private life as well as his public life. He had to deal with his illegitimate children and so on. So Colbert dies worn out in 1683. And after that, the, it's downhill all the way in the rain. And 1675, this is a book called Le Parfait Négociant, written in French, and it is later translated into English, Dutch, German, and Russian. And it shows just how interested Louis XIV and his subjects were in global trade. Louis XIV himself would attend meetings with, say, the merchants of Lille, asking what he could do for them. He founded many trading companies. Here is one of his, the chief merchants of the reign, Samuel Bernard, a former Protestant who converts to Catholicism. And when Louis XIV needs his money, when French finances are desperate, he himself shows Samuel Bernard round his private pleasure gardens at Marly, just north of Versailles, a huge honour which the Duc de Saint-Simon inevitably calls prostitution. But in fact, Louis XIV got his loan. And this is a map showing the companies which Louis XIV helped found in America, in Africa, in Asia. It's he who establishes the first French colonies in India at Pondicherry, for example, which is still French to this day, and in the Indian Ocean, and of course, New France in North America. They're very aware that the Netherlands and England are more advanced in global commerce than France, and they're very keen to catch up. And if it hadn't been for the constant wars of his reign, they might well have done so. And you see that this map shows what the main objects of trade are. Spices, silk, wood, fish, fur, 
and under Guinea you see the sinister word om for the slave trade. And here is North America. Louis XIV personally corresponds with the commander at Quebec, for example. Uh, he's very aware of America. Conversation at Versailles is about America as well as Europe. And it's under him, this is his bust, a copy of the great bust by Bernini, which is in the city of Quebec today. They also have a wonderful portrait by Rigo of Louis XIV. And it's under Louis XIV, 1683, that the great uh, trip of La Salle down the Mississippi is made. And he claims the entire valley for the king and erects a standard with the coat of arms of Louis XIV on it. But the, one of the dramas of Louis XIV's reign is that despite government encouragement, the French won't emigrate. Either it's because the land and climate in Canada and in Louisiana at the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico are so bad, or because they liked living in France and perhaps conditions were not as horrific as they claimed. Or the third reason, so many of the emigrants from England to North America were religious dissidents, Puritans, and so on, and Louis XIV did not allow Protestants or dissidents to emigrate to French colonies, or with this desire for uniformity and Catholicism. 1680s, Louis XIV is megalomaniac. He starts bombarding cities. He's bombarded Algiers. So in retaliation, the ruler of Algiers fires the French consul out of a cannon. There is constant conflict at this time between France and Algeria. Here is Monsieur Levache being fired to his death. And here is the cannon from which he was fired, which was taken as a symbol of victory by the French army in 1830. It's now in Brest and the Algerian government wants it back. No decision has yet been made. And Louis XIV also bombards Genoa, 1684. Really, it's folly de grandeur. There's no particular reason to do so. It's a neutral city. It's against international law. International law, the concept of human rights, is already in the air in the 17th century. Gradually, a body of law is being established by diplomats. And here, in 1685, the Doge of Genoa is forced to come to Versailles, the Galerie des Glaces. You can see Louis XIV in front of his silver throne. This is a picture by Uas, and he's forced to apologize. Really, the Doge is apologizing to the king for the king's crime of bombarding Genoa. 1688 is when things begin to turn against France and Louis XIV, William III with a European army of Swedes, Dutch, French, Danes, Germans and English invades England. He crosses the channel in November and Louis XIV does nothing to prevent him. He's in fact attacking the Rhineland and the Palatinate. Instead, Louis XIV backs a losing cause. This is him welcoming his first cousin, James II, to Saint-Germain-en-Laye on the 6th of January, 1689. The Jacobite court remains in France, subsidized by Louis XIV. He knows James II is a hopeless monarch and general, yet he still goes on supporting him out of glory, Catholicism, shared belief in the divine right of kings. And as a result, two global wars are fought, partly for the throne of England, 1689 to 1697, and later 1702 to 1713, not only in Europe, but in North America. Louis XIV is interested in all of Europe, here is a picture of his ally, 
the King of Poland, Jan Sobieski, with his wife, who is a French woman who frequently corresponds with Louis XIV, largely asking for favours for her own family. This is Louis XIV's cousin, the Prince de Conti, who is his candidate for the Polish crown in 1697. He sails to Danzig, he even lands on shore, but nothing really happens. All the promises from Polish nobles that they would vote for him to be King of Poland were worthless. The hands, it was said, were outstretched not to support the Prince de Conti, but to ask for French gold. And Conti returns to Versailles poorer and sadder than he had left. Here is another of France's allies in Europe, not well known in England, but a national hero today in Hungary, the face of many Florent banknotes, Rakotsi, Prince of Transylvania, a symbol of national independence against the Habsburgs. He also wanted to be ruler of Hungary. He fails, but he comes to stay at Versailles. And he was a great friend as well as an ally of Louis XIV, frequently a guest. So it shows that in some circumstances, France was not on the side of tyranny, but on the side of national independence. Here is Versailles itself. That is also part of Louis XIV's global mission. It was a palace built to impress the world, to impress Europe, to attract foreign visitors. It's not really to dominate the French nobility. Louis XIV had many other means of doing that. It's really in part a global visitor attraction as it was and remained until Covid. Here you see a drawing by Israel Silvestre about 1685 showing the vast size of the palace and of the park. Both were attractions for foreign visitors. It became a destination on the Grand Tour, above all for the English. No nation was more impressed by Versailles and copied it more frequently than the English. Here's another view. 1686, this is, shows Versailles as a global hub. This is the embassy from the King of Siam arriving in the courtyard of Versailles. Really about a hundred Siamese had made the two year long journey by boat from Bangkok to uh, Nantes in Brittany. They climbed the Escalier des Ambassadeurs. It no longer exists but it was in a way a global staircase since it showed the nations of Europe, Asia, Africa and America admiring the bust of the king in the middle of the staircase. And here you see them making obeisance to Louis XIV in his splendour on his silver throne. The crowd was so great that the king himself had to make room for them with his walking stick. The French court wasn't a silent and obsequious court. It was a vast mass of humanity, chattering and moving, pushing and shoving, and they didn't even always respect the king himself. And what is the link between Siam and France? It's desire for trade and also Louis XIV's desire to spread Catholicism. And he praises Catholicism in a letter to the king of Siam saying that it's not only the best and truest religion but also and I quote the one most likely to make subjects obey their monarch and that is really what comes to the heart of the matter and the king of Siam replies to Louis XIV who's urging him to become Catholic saying that if God had wanted everyone to follow the same religion he would not have made such wonderful diversity on earth. And in fact, it's a disaster, Siam. The there is a rising against the Francophile monarch, 1688. Uh, he is imprisoned and all the French troops and merchants are thrown out and Siam closes in on itself.
for the next 150 years. Another example of overreach. Here they are again. It was a much publicized event. Louis XIV was very proud of the embassy and the presence. And some of the King of Siam's presence are still in the Musée Guimet now in Paris. And along with these embassies, the ships, the expansion of France, there are wonderful books often dedicated to Louis XIV. He, would, he was extremely curious and he would talk to travellers at his public dinner, asking them for news of Siam or Egypt or Turkey or wherever they were going to or had come back from and wishing them Godspeed. And the travellers were allowed to dedicate their books um, to Louis XIV himself. This is a travel, the first travel book about Siam by Jesuit fathers sent by the king to India and China. He paid for their travels himself and you can see it is published by express order of his majesty in 1686. He's a very curious global monarch. Another book on Siam by Monsieur de la Loubert, Louis XIV's ambassador. And this is a, the first Chinese visitor to Versailles, Michel Sheng Fu, who is a convert to Catholicism. By then there are French as well as Portuguese and Italian missionaries in Beijing. He's presented to the king and he eats a meal with chopsticks on a gold service in front of the king and the royal family. They are so curious uh, about everything to do with China. It becomes fashionable in Versailles. Everyone who can collects blue and white porcelain. And there are more books about China published by these Jesuit missionaries in Beijing. This is by Father Bouvet. It is dedicated to Louis XIV and inevitably in the dedication Father Bouvet says if it were not for your majesty's divine virtues um, the emperor of China would be the greatest monarch on earth but of course the king of France is even greater but they are considered comparable and the two courts speak to each other a common language of monarchy obedience splendor, hunting, and other courtly pursuits. And here you see some Chinese officers in Monsieur Bouvet's books. There is a great knowledge explosion about China under Louis XIV, and the first book on Confucianism is written by one of these missionaries and dedicated to Louis XIV. So he does show quite an open mind, and the French Jesuits in Beijing are then trying to um, make a concordance between Confucianism and Catholicism, uh, saying Confucianism is only a civil, not a religious uh, movement, but this was later quashed by the Vatican. More ladies. Here is Europe in the reign of Louis XIV. Please note the vast size of the Ottoman Empire in the lower right cor corner. It's a traditional ally of France because they're both enemies of Austria in the middle of Europe. And this alliance flourishes under Louis XIV. He pretends to be a loyal Catholic. In reality, he wants the Ottoman Empire to go on fighting Austria and even to keep or recover Hungary. He doesn't go quite as far as wanting the Ottomans to take Vienna in 1683. Here is Louis XIV's ambassador, Monsieur de Nointel, in front of the Ottoman city of Athens, going on a tour of the Ottoman Empire. No one is quite certain who painted this picture. Probably it's somebody called Jacques Carré. And here is a recently discovered picture of Nuantel in front of Jerusalem, probably the first accurate depiction of the sixth city of Jerusalem. And it's a very peaceful visit. It's, it's a visual 
example of the French Ottoman alliance. Here he is again. It's been discovered above the shop of Oscar de la Renta, Rue de Marignan, off the Champs Elysees. So if you go there, you can go to the first floor and see this extraordinary diplomatic French Ottoman picture. Uh, here is one of the vestments given by Louis XIV's father to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It has the royal arms of France and Navarre on it. It's a unique example of French embroidery of the 17th century, a period which took embroidery very seriously. You were only as good as your embroidery on your coat or dress, and everything else was destroyed in the revolution or through fashion, through being thrown away. It's only survived in Jerusalem because it was a well-protected Ottoman city. Here is one of the many travel writers of Louis XIV's reign, Mr. Tavernier, who's also a jeweler who goes to Persia and India to get better jewels for Louis XIV. He had a, his jewels were as global as his ambitions. An, an account of Constantinople dedicated to the king by Monsieur Grelot in 1690. An account of a trap of a, a journey in the Ottoman Empire by Mr. Tornfor, who is going round the empire to collect bulbs and rare plants for Louis XIV, not only for the government garden, the Jardin du Roi, which still exists in Paris, but also probably for Louis XIV's personal gardens in Trianon and Marly and Versailles. The, the bulbs in Trianon were so the scent was so powerful that sometimes courtiers had to retire indoors. This, this is another travel book about the Ottoman Empire by the Chevalier Davia, who sometimes was a courtier at Versailles and in other years was French consul in Aleppo. This is a marvellous account of Aleppo in the 1680s and 90s under Louis XIV. He knew Louis XIV and had helped Moliere with his Turkish scenes in Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme. And 1686, there is the possibility that the Ottoman Empire might collapse because it's been defeated in front of Vienna. So while in theory maintaining his alliance with the Empire, which is helping French trade, Louis XIV sends a mission round the empire to draw and make plans of the ports and cities just in case the empire collapses and he has to make a quick grab for the best bits of it for France. And so here is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, accurate view of Aleppo, 1686, from a series of drawings which are still in the archives of the Ministère de la Marine in Paris. Here is a view of the port of Sidon in Lebanon. You see the detail with which it's done. It's always guiding French ships in case they decide to land. Here's the island, the city of Paros on the island of Paros in the Aegean, detailed down to the last windmill. And here are the towns of Alexandria and Rosetta in Egypt. And here is a picture by Van Moor of the presentation of two sons of the French ambassador, Monsieur Dondrezel, to the Grand Vizier. It's slightly after the reign of Louis XIV, but in, in the, his speech, the Grand Vizier compliments Louis XV, wishing him a reign as long and happy and successful as that of Louis XIV. The Ottoman government was eager to maintain the alliance with France. And the French ambassador, Monsieur de Ferriol, who is an extremely difficult person, but he does commission some marvelous pictures of the Ottoman Empire 
1707 and 1708 and most of them are now preserved in Amsterdam in the Rijksmuseum in a room called the Turkish Cabinet where you see different costumes and different pro professions a whirling dervish or an Albanian shepherd or a Greek milkmaid and so on or a janissary or a black eunuch this is a unique visual record of the Ottoman Empire commissioned by Louis XIV's ambassador. And the Thousand and One Nights are first translated into a European language, which is French, by Antoine Galland, who had stayed in the French embassy, and he dedicates it to a lady-in-waiting of the king's adored granddaughter-in-law, the Duchesse de Bourgogne. So, at masquerades under Louis XIV, the court would dress up in Turkish costume one day, Chinese costume the next, and so on. The world came to Versailles in many different forms. Now, at the end of the reign, Versailles, the king has kept his conquests and he's kept his grandson on the throne of Spain. But France is in very bad shape economically, and yet the whole business of travellers coming to Versailles, admiring the king, goes on. Here he is receiving the son of the Elector of Saxony and King of Poland, who in fact is a, an adversary politically of France, but culturally he's under the spell. And in the centre is Madame, the king's sister-in-law, who wrote some of the most graphic and brilliant and original letters describing life with Louis XIV. Here is his main German ally, the Elector of Bavaria, who lives for long periods in and outside Paris. Here is the last reception of the reign, February 1715, and he's receiving the Persian ambassadors. What do they talk about? They're talking about trade in the Indian Ocean and over land, French-Persian trade, and above all, naval strategy. Can Persia and France make a naval alliance to crush the Arab rulers of the Gulf? So many matters that are still alive today were being considered in the reign of Louis XIV. And I just want to end with showing the international impact of Versailles, as Louis XIV had intended. He intended it to surpass all other palaces, past and present. This is the main palace of his adversary, William III, Hetlou in the Netherlands, but some of the gardens and much of the way of life of William III, and even the architecture of this palace was inspired by Versailles. William III had asked for a French architect, and he has a French Protestant architect, Daniel Marot. Here is Hampton Court, also built for William III outside London, partly modelled on Versailles, built by Christopher Wren, who had been to Paris and Versailles. Here is Chatsworth, one of the most impressive, perhaps the most luxurious country house in England. It was partly modelled on Marly, the gardens when it was made, 1680s and 1690s, were designed by a Frenchman and modelled on the gardens of Versailles and Marly. And it's frescoed inside by a Frenchman, Louis Laguerre, partly inspired by Versailles. Here is Petworth, another French-style palace built in the 1690s. Here is the ceiling of the Painted Hall at Greenwich, the Royal Naval College in Greenwich, which is one of England's answers to the Galerie des Glaces, glorifying Louis XIV at Versailles. Here is Charlottenburg, outside Berlin, the main country palace of the Hohenzollerns, and the statue in front of it is modelled on the statue of Louis XIV, also surrounded by chained slaves, which was in the uh, Place des Victoires. Here is Peter the Great, 
visiting the young Louis XV in 1717. He appears to have been a very simple, practical monarch who, who pretended he was a craftsman, who learned trades, but here he's wearing the red heels of the courtiers of Versailles, and even he builds this massive palace outside St. Petersburg, Peterhof, partly on the model of Versailles with formal gardens and fountains. So he had a much better water supply than Louis XIV had at Versailles. And just to conclude, Versailles as a global hub, the queues outside Versailles, the number of visitors before COVID, it was going up every year, seven million, seven and a half million. The only other palace visited by more people in the world was the palace of Louis XIV's former ally or friend, the Emperor of China, the Forbidden City in Beijing. So let us hope visitors re return to Versailles this summer, who knows? Thank you very much. Thank you, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? They can um, put them in the chat or raise their hand. Let's see if I can see everyone. Um, I am happy to kick start. I wondered if you, if there was any sort of information on why Louis XIV didn't make the people of Alsace um, convert to Catholicism. I think it was a case of calculation. He, he wanted to conquer or annex other pieces of Germany. So he thought if he was really nice and respectful to the people of Alsace, this would tempt other Germans to accept his sovereignty in Cologne or Mainz or the, the Palatinate. Um, there is one phrase in the diary of the Marquis de Sorge saying, we've got to be nice in Strasbourg because then Ulm and Mainz will accept our rule also. It was, it was a calculation, but he did stick to it. Nobody was, well, a, few, a few leading officials were more or less browbeaten into becoming Catholic, but ordinary Alsatians could remain Lutheran. So the province remains half Protestant and half Catholic to this day. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, Philip, for a wonderful talk. I think everybody's overwhelmed with um, such a fantastic uh, talk and also the beautiful pictorial edition as well. Thank you. I'd love to know more about those at some point. Maybe we can talk about that. Let's hope so, yes. To this. In person. Bye. <laughs> yes, have a good day. Nice. Thank Bye. you. Good night. Thanks all. Thank you.